You're gonna need years of therapy to deal with the way that you've messed them up. We have not. I feel like I know which way we're leaning. If I never tried to do it, I would regret not at least trying. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm so happy that you're here. If it's your first time here, welcome if you're new. This might be a weird video for you to start with, but welcome, I'm happy that you're here. I asked you guys over on Instagram if you wanted an updated Q&A because I try to do those like once a year and I think the last one I did was last January, so it's been a little over. Um, there was a resounding yes from you guys and then you guys submitted a bunch of questions, a lot of questions actually, so let's get into it. Normally I try to sort these out by topic, I didn't do that this time, so we're gonna jump around quite a bit, hopefully you don't mind. But um, yeah, let's just let's just go because we got a lot. First one, would you ever become a foster family? I like to say you never say never because you never know what's on the horizon for you. At this point in time, we don't see ourselves doing that right now. We're still in the process of like family building mode. And for us, the real point of foster care is reunification and providing, you know, a temporary safe space and, and loving home for that child. If it has to be longer than that, if it's forever, then that would be great if that's in the best interest of the child. But right now we wouldn't be able to handle having a child come in and then leave. And I think our kids are too young to really understand that too. And it would be hard for them to get attached and then have their seemingly sibling leave. So right now, I don't think it's the right move for us. In the future when my kids are older maybe I, I think it would be nice I'd, I'd like to I'd like to be at that safe space that loving home for a child for as long as they need me um, but right now we don't have any plans for that but that's not to say that we never will how has raising kids changed your marriage I think the most obvious way is that there's just less time for us to focus on each other and we have to be really really intentional about the time that we spend together and, and putting time into our marriage. Full transparency, we haven't been that great about it recently with the kids being sick for the last like however long it's been. Um, everybody's fine now, but it was like two months of just like the plague. And so in those two months, like we weren't really focused on our, each other or our marriage. It was like all consuming the kids, their health all the time, just exhaustion. And so we have to get back to a place where we're being more intentional with that but that's been like the biggest challenge. What is your best advice for a parent entering their child's toddler era? Buckle up, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I actually love, I love toddlerhood. I really, really do. I think it's a lot, a lot of fun. Ariella's age now, she's not quite two. She'll be two at the end of August, um, is I think my favorite age. I just, I love this age. She's like starting to talk and she could say little sentences and she's so curious, but she's still like, a lovey-dovey like squish and um she's just mm, she's just so delicious um it's it's such a good age but i also love josiah's age i mean i don't love everything about three let's be let's be real three is, is trying um but it's really cool too to see him grow and to see him pick up his own interests and it, it's cool you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of cool things within toddlerhood but i think my best advice is just try to see things through the lens of your child. Um, think about them and their situation and how powerless they probably feel a lot of the times with the fact that like decisions are just being made all day around them, about them and what they do, when they go to sleep, when they eat, what they eat, you know, what they can and can't play with. They wanna play with that outlet. They don't understand why they can't, but you're telling them no, you're a Debbie Downer. Like, Obviously there's things that we have to do to keep them safe, but they don't have the right skills to manage their emotions and their reactions to things just yet. And so they're gonna freak out and they're gonna tantrum and that can be really frustrating for you. It can be embarrassing for you if they're throwing themselves across the floor of a target um, and there's people staring at you. But you kind of have to try to look at it from the lens of them and that really helps you take a more empathetic approach because it's really easy for you to just like lose your ish. But I feel like looking at it through their legs helps you to kind of be a little bit more empathetic and maybe have a little bit more patience in that situation, or at least that helps me. And again, I'm not perfect, so I don't handle it perfectly every time, but that really does help me. What are some of your favorite toddler snack options? Love your meal plans from before. Thank you. Um, I kind of just go with whatever 
Josiah is into at the moment. It kind of ebbs and flows. Um, so right now they're very into peach cups, you know, those little like diced peaches in the, in the juice. Um, so they really love those. They love mandarin oranges. They love, um, like pirate's booty, veggie straw kind of things. They love a little toddler cheese plate, which is just like a crackers, little, I'll cut up a cheese square and, um, some like turkey pepperoni. Sometimes we do that for dinner because they love that so much. A little baby charcuterie. Animal crackers, graham crackers. Oh, and Josiah's like favorite thing. How can I forget? Like his favorite thing ever is fruit snacks, which is not my favorite thing because I'm sure it's probably like bad for their teeth or whatever, but some snacks should be healthy and some snacks should also just be fun. I don't like to eat apples all the time as a snack. Sometimes I want junk food and so I allow it every now and then. Does Jojo start school soon? So I know in some areas you could like apply to have your kid entered in kind of like a public school type program for preschool or whatever. We don't have that here so if you're sending your kid to school before kindergarten like that's on you and your own wallet um, and the prices are astronomical. Your kid's tuition payment could be as much as like your mortgage and so because we've had family that's been able to watch him this far and and it's not cost us anything um we've kept him home also like i just like being able to like pop out of my office midday and like you know have a snack with him or like just talk to him um it's getting harder and harder now the older that he gets like because he bangs down my door when i'm at home but um i do i do love seeing him and i would miss seeing him i'm not that selfish that i would keep him home against you know sending him out to you know experience school um but we have been talking about like in the fall putting him in a program for like maybe two days a week and see how it goes um it's just difficult for us to wrap our minds around especially with gun violence in this country and how scary it can be to do something as simple as send your kid to school um and then also there's the cost factor to wrap your mind around so we'll probably start slow and, and see how it goes um but yeah i think he will soon i just i just haven't you know nailed down the details of, of when would you ever move out of new jersey again never say never but i think that some some things would have to be in place situation that betters our family for us to do that right like it would have to mean that we'd be able to live off of like one income because we wouldn't have our support system to help us so like if i could stay home and be the the caretaker of the children while mike works like that would be a reason um if my mom agrees to like you know go with me that might be a reason um, but other than that i don't i don't see us leaving the state. Do you still plan to have more kids? Right now the plan is still that we want at least a third child and then from there we're gonna assess. But I know for sure that we both feel like we want a third child. Some days I don't know why we feel that way because it is hard <laughs> even with just the two. Um, but I just feel like we both feel like we're not done. Like somebody's missing. Somebody hasn't joined us yet and they're on their way we just don't know when and who they'll be um but i definitely think that a third child is i mean hopefully it's not fully in our hands we can only do what we can do and then the rest is you know not up to us but we hope that there's a third baby on the horizon for us because we would like one and josiah and ariella both say that they would like a sibling have you decided to adopt or try to conceive baby number three we have not I feel like I know which way we're leaning, but we haven't made like a firm 100% decision about that yet. It's still still being discussed and we're not ready yet. So we still have some time to kind of like figure it out. What is your relationship with the kid's birth mom like? Does she visit the kids? So we have a great relationship with their birth parents, their mother especially. Um, I speak to her at minimum once a week. Um, do we have like a standing visit on the books with them? No. Um, we don't. They have seen the kids since the kids have been born and placed with us, but we don't have like a regular visit that we do. Um, we were supposed to get together in March, but the kids were sick. I was supposed to plan like a family fun day for all of us. Um, so in the summer, we'll likely try to reschedule and like have like a barbecue here at the house or something. Um, a great way for us to kind of just like chill back and, and catch up and everybody gets to visit with everybody. So we are absolutely open to visits. So like whenever they want to see the kids, they can literally just let us know and we will arrange it. What has been the experience of raising a girl versus a boy for you and Mike as parents? It's funny, we were kind of just talking about this the other day and I have no idea if this is like a girl or boy thing so much as it's just like who they are as little people, but <laughs> Josiah was such a chill baby and he is such a active, just wild toddler. 
and Ariella was the opposite. Like Ariella was a little bit more high maintenance as a baby. I don't want to say difficult because I feel like that's very negative, but she was definitely a baby that cried more, that wanted to be held more. She took a little bit longer to sleep through the night. Um, she was a little bit harder for us to just like read as a baby like Josiah we got to a point with him where it was like you knew that when he cried he wanted like one of these three things and it was like easy to figure out Ariella like I just think that sometimes she just was in a mood or she was just like in her feelings and wanted to express that because like nothing you would do could like fix the mood that she was in or get her to stop crying uh, so we like to say she was just like a little tad bit more high maintenance but as a toddler homegirl is chill when you're on an outing, you just put her in a stroller. You could forget that she's even there. She doesn't say anything until she's ready for water and a snack. But Josiah, you cannot forget that Josiah is with you ever because he is constantly screaming that he wants to get out of the stroller. He's running away from you. You're chasing after him. He is just everywhere. So like that's the biggest difference, I think, between the two of them. But again, I don't know if that's a gender thing or if it's just like who they are as people. <laughs> is Ariella a daddy's girl? A bike would like to think yes. I would say like yes, but also no. She loves her daddy for sure, talks about daddy all the time, wants to call daddy on the phone while he's at work and see pictures of him, um, loves her father, no doubt. But Ariella is a lot like me in the sense that she is not the most cuddly baby. She has her moments. She has her moments for sure. Sometimes she surprises me. I'll be like laying on the couch and she'll come and snuggle up and lay with me and watch, you know, whatever I'm watching on TV. But she's not typically the most snuggly baby. And Mike is, the, he's so affectionate and he's especially affectionate with the kids. And so he tries to like, you know, cuddle her and hold her. And like, sometimes she lets him. She lets him have his moment and she stays in his content. But a lot of the times she's squirmy and she's crying and she's like, let me go. She's just not feeling it. And so I say yes and no. Um, it depends on her mood. Who she's super obsessed with though is neither of us. She loves my stepdad, Papa Z, all about Papa Z. Grabs my phone and pretends to call Papa Z all day long. Always talks about Papa Z, wants to see Papa Z. She loves her Papa Z. So she's a Papa Z girl. What stroller do you recommend? Just adopted our baby girl. Congratulations, that's so exciting. We have tons of strollers, probably way too many strollers. So I feel like I can give you a good stroller rack at this point, but I would really recommend the Mockingbird stroller. When we bought ours, they didn't at the time convert to two seaters. Now they do. So. For me, that's like the perfect if you want to have more kids or you plan to have any more kids or you already have a, a toddler and you're now the baby. It's perfect um, because you could do the two where you're, they're kind of like stacked vertically. It has the same like style and design features as the Uppa Baby, which is a very, very expensive stroller. However, the price point is closer to that of a Kiko situation. Um, I don't know how much they cost now. I think when we bought ours, they were like 350. I don't know with inflation, if they've gone up in price or what, but I would still say as far as it goes for the fact that it looks just like the upper baby and has a lot of those features, it comes in at a much lower price point than that. So I recommend that they've got accessories that you can add on bassinets, the car seat attachments for all the different car seats that, that are out on the market. Um, and they have really good customer service from when I had to, to, to speak with them. So I recommend The Mockingbird very highly. What has been the hardest part of being a mom so far? Being a mom is absolutely amazing. It's the best thing that's ever happened to me, but for sure it has, has pain points, right? For me, the hardest part about being a mom is that constant fear of like messing up or not doing it right and like what that's going to do to your child down the road, right? Like your biggest fear is like that you're gonna mess them up somehow <laughs> and they're gonna need years of therapy to deal with the way that you've messed them up. Um, and so I struggle with that a lot, you know? I, I beat myself up when I lose my patience with them or when I don't feel like I've handled something properly. I beat myself up over the fact that like I could do better, I could do more. Um, and it's like a constant battle but it's like really self-imposed. It's like you do it to yourself because deep down we all wanna be like the best possible mom that we can be or the best possible parent that we can be for our kids. So that for me has been the hardest part is just like telling myself to chill out, that you're doing okay, that they're gonna be okay, that they love you even though you've made a mistake. What is one pricey baby product that 
is worth the money. So for me personally, because I was a formula feeding mom, I really, really enjoyed the convenience of the baby Brezza, the little formula dispensing machine. It's like a baby Keurig, that's what I like to call it. Um, I love that thing, and I personally think that's worth the money if you're gonna formula feed, especially if you have other kids that you're taking care of, because it literally makes that part of your day especially in the beginning when you're doing it like every three hours, it makes it just so much easier. Um, so I recommend that, but I understand that that's not every family's journey. So I think probably the best thing that you could spend your money on like universally is just a good convertible car seat. I don't love infant carriers. I've said that before on here. We have one because we had one with Josiah. Um, and we used it with Ariella too, just because we had it. I personally don't love them. If I could go back and do it again, knowing what I know now, I would have just bought one good convertible car seat that we can use from infancy all the way up until they're like ready for a booster seat. We use the Maxi Cosi Priya for both of our kids and I love it. Love it so much I bought it twice, I guess. <laughs> How do you and Mike handle differences in parenting styles? I would say the biggest differences in our parenting is that like I am a little bit more patient and a little bit more quick to be empathetic with the kids and try to explain why I'm saying no or explain why we're you, they can't do X, Y, Z or you know, do a lot of talking to them before I get to the point where I'm implementing consequences for like their behaviors or the things that they're doing or saying. Whereas Mike is a lot more quick to jump in with the consequence. It's like, I said no and you did it, so here's the consequence. And I'm not saying that his way is wrong, it's just different from the way that I do it. Um, and I get it, everybody has different levels of patience and tolerance, and so, you know, there's definitely areas where maybe I could be more firm, and there's definitely areas where he could probably be a little bit more soft, a little bit more empathetic. We're learning and working on it every day. But it's funny because like, you know, sometimes when the, kid, <laughs> the kids are like really, really acting up and I'm like, I need backup, Mike. He comes downstairs and tries to do exactly what it is that I've asked him to do, which is provide backup and be like that firm, like dad and use that dad voice. And as soon as he does it, and I look at my babies, I'm like, uh, 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 you're talking to my guy all wrong here. Like you can't talk to my babies like that. And he's like, literally you have to let me parent. You have to let me do it. And I, and I know, I do. It's hard for me because I'm the primary parent and I'm with them all week long. So when he comes home on Saturday, not ready to let the reins go, I still want us to do it my way, but I am learning every day. If you could eat only one food forever, what would it be? That's fairly easy because I am a peasant and I would choose like chicken tenders and french fries with like a good honey mustard on the side. What is the hardest part of being a working mom? Oh gosh, I feel like the hardest part of being a working mom is like that idea that you're supposed to work like you don't have children but also like mother your children or parent your children like you don't have a career um it's such a tricky balance between them both and i feel like i am never doing a good job at both of them at the same time you know when i'm killing it at motherhood uh i'm probably you know not as focused or not, you know, as driven in my, my career or my work life. And if I'm driven in my work life and I'm really focusing on all the things and the projects and, you know, being good enough for that promotion, you know, I'm not killing it at motherhood when that's, you know, my focus. And so it's just like that, that line of trying to balance both and, and just be like good enough in both areas. Tips for being productive when you're an exhausted parent, caffeine. No, really, caffeine. I start my day with caffeine because I need it. And then at like four, five o'clock, when most people have stopped drinking coffee, I've heard people drink, you know, a coffee for that afternoon slump. Um, I do it for the evening slump, okay? I push through. I start to feel a slump at, at like two o'clock, but I push through it. Um, and I have, you know, either a coffee or like a Alani like energy drink come like four or five o'clock so that I can get through um, that after work you know, shift. I work my nine to five and then I work my five to nine. So do you think you'll adopt again? I guess this kind of goes back to like the, do you know how you want to go about adding baby number three to your family? And like I said, we haven't made a decision, you know, a hundred percent one way or the other yet. Um, but we're obviously always very open to adoption. What was the hardest part of the adoption process for you guys? Um, for us, I would say it was, the hurdles of dealing with 
the failed match and then the disrupted placement. Those were really, really difficult to go through. Some people or families never experience that on their adoption journey. Some families experience it multiple times before they get placed. Um, so I guess we fall somewhere in the middle of the two. Even though I fully believe and support anyone who decides that they in fact want to figure it out and, and figure out how to parent their own child and I support that fully, it's still difficult to be on the other end of that and have your hopes up or even be with the child for an amount of time and then have to kind of like relinquish them. It's still difficult even though I support the child going you know with their biological family always that is in fact a viable option. I would say most of the families that reach out to me um, to talk about their experience or the things that they're going through a lot of them say the hardest part for them is the waiting had that been our situation I think that would have been the hardest part for me too. Do you practice punishments with the kids? So I personally don't like to call it punishment because I feel like that word is just like super severe and we're talking about like really little people. I like to refer to them as consequences because you know as an adult every action we take has a consequence right and why not learn that when you're a child? So in terms of discipline, I usually use timeout as a method. Um, your timeout lasts as long as your age. So um, if you're three, your timeout is three. If you're one and a half, it's one and a half minutes. And the first half of timeout is typically spent trying to calm said child down because they're usually upset that they're now in timeout. And then the second half is explaining to them what behavior or action landed them in the timeout and that the timeout is a consequence of, of said action. So that they can hopefully try to link the two in their mind. For me personally, I don't like the whole like, sit here and think about what you've done and then you walk away because like a three-year-old is not thinking about what they've done. They're, they're not, they're just wanting to get out of timeout. Um, and so, you know, the first several times when we first started implementing timeout, I was like, for sure, they have no idea what any of this is. Um, and I'm talking to them and it's in one ear right out the other. Also for discipline, like when the kids are like fighting over the same thing or they're not like sharing properly, we do the whole like, I'm gonna take it away now because you guys haven't shared this very well and you're fighting over it. I'm taking it now and I will give it back to you later today and we can try again or I'll give it back to you tomorrow and we can try again. Is this your forever home? I hope so. I really, really love our house and even more than our house i love the area that we live in and that's even harder to find i feel like you know find houses everywhere but like you might not like the location of said house so i love the location of said house i love our house it is not the kind of house that you see you know influencers building and buying on instagram when you log on with the big white kitchen and the open floor plan our house was built in the early 60s and like has a very distinctive 60s architecture to it um and you know it's got an interesting split level floor plan it's a little choppy up here we've got one wall on this floor and it's right behind me and it's this one little wall is separating like three rooms and everybody says we should just open this room up and knock this wall down but like I like this little stupid wall that has no purpose behind me. I enjoy it. So sorry if you can hear Brody snoring throughout this video. His bed is over here and he is just wiling out, catching up on his Z's. Um, yeah, I, I love our house. I mean, we bought it knowing that it needed work and that, you know, the bedrooms were tiny and we also saw a lot of potential because of the way our roof line slopes. There's nothing above the room that I'm in now, our living room. There's no upstairs above our living room, dining room, bedroom, and garage. And so in the future, we could always blow out our roof line and we could build up and over um, and allow us some more space or some larger bedrooms. Um, and so we bought the house with the intention of staying here forever and just making it that forever home. Do you guys plan on more children or is this it? We hope to have a third child. Again, only part of that is in our control. We can try and then from there it's in God's hands, but um, we do want a third child at least and then we will assess. Once you decided to adopt, did you do your home study first or find an agency? We found an agency first and then completed our home study through our agency. Do you feel resentment for being the primary parent? Listen, let's be honest here. Sometimes, sometimes I do. I love being my kid's favorite. I do. Um, but, you know, when you are the primary parent and then on top of that, the majority of the domestic labor in your house falls on you as well. And you work a full-time job. Like, yeah, sometimes I look at Mike and I'm like, you lucky 
lucky man. You get to leave this house. People don't hang on you all day and whine for snacks at your feet all day while you're trying to type email. You know, you don't have to log out of work and log directly into parenthood and make dinner and wash dishes. Like, damn, I wanna be you when I grow up. <laughs> I will say though, when I do have those moments, when I do feel that resentment starting to like set in, I tell Mike, I'm like, listen, this is how I feel right now. Uh, and maybe I feel this way because of X, Y, Z, or maybe I could use a little help in this department or like whatever. And I try to let him know because if I don't give him the opportunity to help create change that could make me feel better about the situation, then I'm only creating an environment for that resentment to grow and get worse. Um, and so I try to nip it in the bud. Um, when I do feel it coming up. I try to get the help that I need from him um, so that I don't feel that way. Advice for navigating getting to know an expected mother you've been matched with. That can absolutely be a tricky situation to navigate. It is, it's a very delicate blend of like wanting to get to know somebody and forge this new beautiful relationship, but also there is a lot of pain that's going on at the same time. Um, you know, no matter how confident somebody is in their decision to place, it's still difficult and it still means that they're losing something very important for you to gain something very important. And so it is difficult. I just say, take it slow. Um, you know, start reaching out directly if your agency allows it, if the, if the expectant parent is, is okay with that too. And just getting to know them little by little, like keep it light at first and then kind of start getting into the more important details of kind of what they want that relationship with you to look like going forward, especially after placement. Um, and don't get offended if it takes a while if, or if it doesn't, you know, kind of look exactly how you think it's going to look right at first. Try to understand that it is kind of a delicate situation to navigate and they have a lot of feelings of their own too. And so just take it slow. Don't be offended. Don't take things personally and just always reach out. If they're not reaching out, you still have to be the one to reach out. Just keep reaching out and forging that relationship. Gender wise, do you have a preference for the next baby? No, um, we don't have a preference. As a matter of fact, I was saying to Mike the other day, I think if we were to like conceive and be carrying a child, I don't know that we would find out the gender. I never, ever, ever thought that I'd be somebody that didn't want to know the gender. <laughs> Because I just like I don't like surprises and I like to know everything and be like aware of everything that's coming down the pipeline I think the fact that we already have like one of each it, it almost doesn't matter if you don't try to get pregnant Do you think that you will regret it? I think that at one point in time I did think that If I never tried to do it, I would regret not at least trying um, I I don't feel that way anymore. I, it doesn't matter to me one way or another. Um, and I guess it's because like I have my children um, and I love my children so much. I don't think about the fact that my kids are not of my blood and flesh every day. It doesn't, it doesn't even occur to me most of the time. For me personally, I am, it's not important to me. I don't, think I'll regret it. I think that I have enough love in my life and enough amazing experiences within motherhood that I don't feel like I would regret not being pregnant or trying to be pregnant. All right, guys, that is it. I feel like I have been talking for an eternity. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please do all the things. Give it a thumbs up. Leave me a comment down below. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos in the future. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.